Welcome, everybody. My name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist for the Xerces Society. I, I direct our bumblebee conservation programs. I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Um, really happy to be with you this evening to share this information with you. Um, I'm going to pass it over here to Leaf in a second, who will introduce himself and take us off um, down the first uh, part of our journey together. Um, I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with, with Zoom. We have a chat function there, which you're welcome to use. Um, although if you have a specific question that you would like Leaf and I to address, we will not be able to monitor the chat. And we would ask that you please use the Q&A for that. There's a separate Q&A. So if you click on that, um, you should be able to uh, specifically add some questions that you'd like to have answered during the webinar. Feel free to put those in there at any point, And we, we may take some breaks or do a whole batch of question and answers at the end. There should also be a closed captioning option for you down at the bottom. Um, this is an automatic function. So it's listening to our voices and trying to recreate that. So my understanding is it gets, it, my understanding is that it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. So if you need access to the closed captioning, please feel free to use that feature. You can find it in your toolbar at the bottom. Uh, the only other thing that I would ask is there, there may or may not be a raise hand function. Um, I would ask that you try to avoid using that button. Um, it just flashes like a big yellow flash on my screen and I get distracted when I'm presenting. Leaf may not have that problem, but I do apparently. So we just ask that you avoid from using the raised hand unless we're doing like a Q&A or something like that. And then, um, then feel free to do that. Uh, I think those are the logistics. With that, I will pass it back over to Leaf and we will get started. All right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, so I'm Leif Richardson. I'm a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society also. Uh, I work with Rich on the Bumblebee Project, um, and I run the California Bumblebee Atlas, and I'm based in Riverside, California. Um, and uh, so this is titled somewhat informally in Identifying Bumblebees in Western North America, and we will be doing just that for the next two hours. Uh, some of you will have um, heard us talk, uh, give a, a basic background talk about bumblebees, perhaps for a bumblebee atlas. And in those in those forums, we will talk about uh, bumblebee ecology, um, their declines, the the various status statuses, and then maybe threats that are affecting bumblebees. We won't be doing any of that tonight. We'll be focused on identification. So um, so we'll dispense with all of the basic stuff and we'll just get right down to identifying bees. And um, when they're not named with a text box, I'm going to try to tell you what the bee is. And so these are both, I think, uh, Bombus flava fronds, um, uh, a, a photo taken in uh, Eastern Oregon. Okay, let's see. Slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, first, just a bit about the Xerces Society. Um, so Rich and I work for this organization. We protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We organize our work around five uh, thematic areas, one about native pollinator conservation, uh, endangered species, aquatic invertebrates, butterfly conservation, and pesticides. And Rich and I work in the endangered species group um, since uh, so much of our work has to do with rare bumblebees. Um, we are a, uh, uh, an evidence-based organization. We use science to find out whether invertebrates uh, need protection or habitat restoration or other interventions. Um, and we do our science with a broad array of, uh, of partners in academia, in government, both state and federal uh, and provincial, uh, and with many other folks as well. And significantly, we do a lot of community science. So we will mention a few times tonight the Bumblebee Atlas project that many of you, um, I know from having seen you say hello um, in the chat, uh, many of you are, um, are volunteers for these atlases. Uh, but we have other uh, community science projects with monarch butterflies, with freshwater mussels, with fireflies, which is an exciting newer one. So if you're interested in community science, there is a link at the bottom of the screen that you could go to uh, to learn more about Xerces work in this area. Um, and uh, one of those, uh, as I said, one of those community science projects is these bumblebee atlases. This year we are running these atlases in 15 states nationwide. 
and we will be adding a whole bushel of other states uh, next year. So this is a rapidly ex expanding project with many, um, many hundreds, well, actually thousands of volunteers involved across the country. Um, so bumblebee identification might be your special interest or uh, something you've just found out about. But just so you know, there are many other folks out there who are also interested in this stuff. And that's exciting to us. Um, and uh, we're a nonprofit organization. And so if you are a member, we thank you for being one. And if you would like to support our work, there is a link there for becoming a member or donating. So thank you. Uh, so how do we identify things? This is a this is a talk about how to identify bumblebees. How do we actually do that? Well, classically, um, scientists will use keys, identification keys, to figure out what species that, or other taxon they are looking at. The one I'm showing here, the text is a is a dichotomous key, meaning that there are pairs of statements that should be mostly mutually exclusive. And you look at the organism in hand, and you read the two options, and you choose which one is applies to your to your animal or or plant. So the first one there, number one, it says females and males, right? So it's usually pretty easy to figure out which uh, sex the the bumblebees are. If it was a female, you would go to couplet number two, which is the next one there. If it was a male, you'd go all the way to twenty five. And so we we pass through the key like this answering questions. Uh, it's not necessarily easy, but um, there are just two options in, in each case until we get to a place where we get we get a species identification. And usually that comports closely with um, the bee that we are looking at. Again, this is Bombus flavifrons. So um, we at Xerces, uh, we like to modify the dichotomous key idea for teaching bumblebee identification. And in our beginning um, workshops, we teach people to start with an unknown bug and decide, is it a bee or some other insect? That's the first dividing line there, first couplet, if you will, at the top. Then is it, if it's a bee, is it a bumblebee or some other type of bee? And then within bumblebees, is it male, is it female? And then finally, is it a cuckoo bumblebee um, or Sitheris is the technical name for that group, or is it a non-cuckoo bumblebee or non sitheris And we divide that into uh, under both males and females, and I'll show you why. So, uh, so the reason we, we break out cuckoo bumblebees right now, again, also called Sitheris, um, is that they're quite different from their non-cuckoo bumblebee sisters um, in a number of ways. And so one of the ways we're gonna know that we're looking at a cuckoo bumblebee is to look at the tarsus of the hind leg, the tibia of the hind leg, sorry. It, this is the longest uh, segment on the hind leg that you can see right there. It's a bit shiny in this image. Um, and so uh, I'll go through four different character states for this. So in male, uh, cuckoo bumblebees. This is going to be kind of pockmarked and not smooth, as you can see here, not particularly shiny, and it's going to be either flat or convex. Uh, by contrast, in a non sitheris or non cuckoo bumblebee male, which is most of the bumblebees, um, it's going to be similar, but usually you will see a little area, a, a shiny area in the middle that is that is hairless um, or or doesn't have a lot of hair, but is actually shiny, and it might be surrounded by that that stippled area that we also see there. Um, with the females, the uh, female cuckoo bumblebee is gonna have the, the tibia completely covered in um, in stippling or, or sort of rugosity. So it's it's not smooth at all, it's, it's bumpy. Um, and it's not gonna have a, a hairless area and it is not going to be concave. In fact, they are often convex. And so they're actually poking toward you in this image that the tibia is. And then finally, the non-cuckoo bumblebee females, the ones that carry pollen back to the nest, have a very different uh, look to their tibia. They have a, a wide, shining, concave, hairless area, which you can clearly see in this photo. And then they have those black, or they have those bristly, bristly like hairs that arc over that um, that thing. And we call it, together we call that a pollen basket. It's where those bees carry the pollen. There are other things for distinguishing uh, cuckoo bumblebees and non-cuckoo bumblebees, but for now I will leave it there. And we're going to do, uh, we're going to go through a little bit of morphology uh, uh, information, which you will need to interpret what we're going to tell you about each of the species. So this is fairly basic. Don't get psyched out by the uh, technical language here. There is a little bit. Um, so uh, like other insects, uh, bumblebees have three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And these 
body parts can further be segmented out into, into different segments. So we, we're showing on the abdomen there, there are six different segments within the abdomen of a female bee. There are actually seven on a male bee. And we call them terga, T-E-R-G-A, and um, or uh, singular is a, a tergum. And um, we abbreviate that T. So T1, T2, T3. So you will hear us use that language. T3 is black in this case, for example. Um, the underside of the, the abdomen has sternal segments, which we abbreviate S1 through 6. We won't talk about that too often. Um, the head has uh, has various other structures that are important, and we'll move on to the next slide to talk about that. Uh, you don't need to memorize everything on this slide. I'm going to go around this picture of the face, the head of a bumblebee, and tell you what is important for tonight's material. So first of all, we see that the eyes, the, the compound eyes, what we normally would just call the eyes, the big, the big, uh, the big er eyes. Um, at the top of the head, we see the ocelli, which are, are small, simple eyes. There are three of them. Um, that top of the head is called the vertex. Uh, and we are interested in many cases in the color of the hair on the vertex. The face is right where the, the antenna or, originate. And we are again going to be interested in the color of hair there. Uh, the ab the antenna uh, have 12 segments in females and 13 in males. And on the right side here, I have this busy explanation of two different ways of enumerating the segments, which is important in those keys. Um, and you don't have to necessarily know all of that, but just know that each uh, antennal segment actually is valuable in terms of understanding which B is which. Um, and then uh, really importantly, uh, we want to look at the cheek, which is below the compound eye. So it's, it's labeled on the left. It's also called the malar space. This is the area below the compound eye and above the insertion of the mandible or jaw of the bee. So let's talk more about that. Why do we care about the cheek? Well, uh, bumblebees don't have a lot of morphological distinctions that we can use to identify them. And this is one that we do have, that they do have. And so here you can see uh, cheeks of three different lengths, a long, a medium, and a short. And we're bracketing the size there just to show you what I'm talking about. And these are all closely related bees from the same subgenus of the genus Bombus. So they're not that different from each other. They are different species, but their relatives, and you can see this variation in the cheek length. Um, so this is very important to identifying these bees. Um, but really, we're we're interested also in the width of this thing. So it's really the dimensions and two, the two dimensions that we're interested in. And I will show you. There we go. Oh, there we go. Um, here's a here's a picture of um, the rusty patch bumblebee, one that we will not see in Western North America. It's from the Midwest. And you've probably heard about it. Um, and here I'm illustrating with red arrows the two dimensions that we care about on the cheek. Um, so there's the vertical one from the eye to the with the mandible attaches, and then there's the horizontal one that is from the one hinge to the other hinge of the mandible. And in this case, I hope you can see that this is shorter than it is wide. And so with the bumblebees, we will generally say um, it has a cheek or malar ratio that is greater than one, that thus it's long, it's less than one, or it's short, or it's about one and it's equal. And this is a character that takes time to really appreciate. You've got to look at lots of bees before you really start to see it and understand it. And it is quite variable, but this is an important one and we will talk about it repeatedly tonight. So let's get on to the task of identifying bumblebees to species. Well, you may have heard um, tonight or before that we often use hair color as um, as field marks um, or uh, uh, traits in the lab that we might look at to distinguish one species from another. Um, and here we're showing three different separate species that have almost identical color patterns, at least from a, a gross sense in these little cartoons. And so unfortunately, a lot of bumblebee species look similar to each other and hair color is not necessarily helpful. Um, and uh, Coupled with that is uh, a taxonomist once described bumblebees as morphologically monotonous, meaning that they don't have a lot of physical morphological characteristics that we can look at to measure as do other bees. And so we're stuck with these, these big colorful animals that seem like they're distinctive, but um, the thing that we can see readily, the hair color is not always good enough for identification. Nonetheless, we will talk a lot about hair color tonight and um, we will try to guide you in distinguishing the finer points of how the hair color patterns are different. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, these 
color patterns are so difficult is that within a species, we see a lot of variation in the color pattern around the range. So this is an image um, that shows one species or perhaps two, um, depends on the taxonomist you talk to, uh, that is highly variable around its range. So in California, it is always black and yellow. Uh, up in the Pacific Northwest and in the Rocky Mountains, it is generally quite red in the abdomen. The same species, it's not even um, subspecies. It's, it's quite, quite similar. Uh, add to that, that bumblebees, wherever you are on the continent, uh, they tend to form mimetic complexes, mimicry complexes, where uh, a suite of species will look very, very similar. And this is because on rather short evolutionary timescales, they have adapted to look similar to each other. And the explanation that biologists have is that this reinforces the signal that they are sending to predators that they are not something to eat, that they will sting you if you try to eat them. So the more bees that look the same, um, the fewer times a bee has to die in the, in the beak of a bird before that bird understands that that color pattern is dangerous. So um, in, on the Pacific coast, we have a lot of bees that are largely black with yellow stripes, like the ones in the bottom left hand um, corner of this uh, uh, sort of central bottom of this slide. Um, uh, elsewhere in the West, we see the other two patterns in the top right there, where um, in one case, there's a lot of red, and in the other, uh, there's there's uh, the striping is quite distinctly different from the first category that I talked about. So wherever you are, you have bumblebees, and um, unfortunately, you have a lot of them that are going to look similar to each other. So uh, that is why we need to talk in depth about some of the more difficult ones to identify. So we don't, um, in, the, in the bumblebee atlases, as many of you are, are already aware, we do not require that people learn to use dichotomous keys or get down in the weeds with identification. Um, we support people to do as much of that as they want, but we produce rather simplistic identification guides like this one here for California, which shows one or at most two images of, of females only of each species from the state. And so if you find a bee like the one on the right with brilliant red uh, bands on T2 and T3, surrounded by yellow on T1 and T4, then you, you go to this thing and ask, okay, where are the red banded bees? Oh, they're in box number one. Um, which one is yellow, red, red, yellow? And you start to see there are more than one options. Uh, there's more than one option, but um, but there's the one that we're looking for. So we have some, some shortcuts and some ways that beginners can start to learn bumblebees. Um, with that, uh, for the next, um, uh, 40 minutes or so, we are going to talk about the various categories that I just showed you. And we're going to talk about each of the bees in um, that group. Um, we will be focused on talking about female color patterns. Uh, so we may say something that does not is not true for the males and just understand that we're talking about the females. We are going to talk about males a bit towards the end of our two hours together. But for now, this will be about females. And so Rich is going to take it from here and talk about those bees that have red and orange or orange on the abdomen. Thanks, Leif. You should have control, Rich. I am in control. Uh, let's see if I actually do. Yeah, looks like great. I do. Okay, um, great. There was one comment or question that was thrown in the Q&A here about, um, <laughs> was this gonna be recorded? This is a lot of information that's coming at me very quickly, which which it is. Um, you know, We're trying to cover close to 30 species of bumblebees in detail and how to identify them and their morphology and lots of different things in, in two hours. So we're trying to compact a lot of material into a very short period of time. This is being recorded. It will be posted. Um, I'm gonna drop a link here in the chat to the Xerce Society YouTube channel. Um, I will say that in addition to this webinar, there are several other identification webinars that Leif and I have taught you could probably find them on the Xerces Society um, YouTube channel, or you could go to our individual um, Atlas pages. So if you went to the California Bumblebee Atlas page or the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas page, there are also training materials there that will take you to um, all the way back to that sort of decision tree that Leaf showed at the beginning that sort of will walk you through things much more slowly. This is sort of, as Leaf mentioned, we're sort of jumping in kind of at an advanced level here. It's not super advanced. We're not gonna get out rulers and start measuring mailer spaces, but 
we we're jumping in that you sort of have a base, you know, assuming you have a baseline of knowledge. That doesn't mean if you don't, if you're brand new, that you shouldn't stay. You should definitely stay. This is all approachable material. And the more times you hear it, the better. Feel free to ask questions, whatever. Um, but yes, it is a lot of material and you will, your eyes will be spinning by the time that you're, you know, we're done. There are, there are, there are lots of bees. They may already be spinning as you look at the cartoons that are here on the screen and you recognize that there are, you know, 11 species or something like that that have red on them and you may think they all look the same. So just, um, just know that there's lots of materials learning how to identify bumblebees is is like learning how to identify lots of other taxa it's you know it requires a lot of time um and, and a lot of resources and you'll get better over time um so so yeah have fun with it it's really there are uh, uh, some some cool animals so as leaf mentioned i'm going to start with the animals that, uh, that have red on their body somewhere keep in mind that that some of the species that you see on this screen right now, like Bombus flavifrons, Bombus melanopygus, Bombus silvicola, Bombus rufocinctus, Bombus bifarius, also have color patterns that do not have red on them. So it does get a little bit confusing, but try to try to bear with us. So there are some species that will appear in many different or a couple of different groups because of the differences within the species. So. With that, we will get started. We're going to go through these uh, 11 different species and talk about some of the characteristics that we look at, particularly when we're thinking about photo-based identification. So what are the things that Leaf and I are looking at when we're looking at photos to try to identify bumblebees? OK, so we're going to start with Bombus huntii. Bombus huntii is a very nice species to begin with, um, largely because it's very consistent. It has um, uh, its color, it only has one different color pattern. So just to orient you to the slides, every species slide that we're going to show you will look somewhat like this. Over here above the map, you will see cartoons of the um, of the queen and of the worker. And then there will be a distribution map. And then there will be some similar lookalikes up here above the photos. And then some of the characteristics that we look at um, below that. And then there'll be a picture of the bee. And these purple arrows that pop up here will be pointing towards features of the bee that we look at. So with Bombus huntii, there is only one cartoon which means that there's very little variation in the species, which means that identifying it is fairly straightforward. So what do we look at with Bombus huntii? First of all, we're gonna look at its thorax, so the part between its head and its abdomen, and it's gonna be mostly yellow with a black band in between the wings. That black band is sometimes called an interalar band, so it has a strong interalar band and you'll notice that there's no yellow hairs mixed in that interalar band. They're all black hairs. Likewise, in front of that band and behind that band are all yellow hairs. There's no what we call admixture or cloudiness in that space. Those are all yellow hairs. And so that clean yellow with a sharp black band between it is really... Um, descriptive of the species. And when you combine that with a with an abdomen pattern that starts with T1, where my arrow is pointing right now, is yellow. T2 is red. T3 is red. T4 is yellow. T5 is black. T6 is also black. So that yellow, red, red, yellow banding on its abdomen combined with no admixture on the, the thorax is a pretty good indicator that you've got Bombus huntii. A couple of other things that we're gonna look at for this species is that its hair is short and even. It doesn't look like, it, it looks like it's been combing itself and grooming itself, and that's fairly consistent. The hair on its face and head are also quite yellow. Um, and so these are things that, that we look at. Um, the other arrow that Leaf has pointed here, or that we have pointed here is towards this, 
pollen glob. Um, so, so bumblebees carry their pollen in the corbicula, as, as Leith mentioned before. They mix their pollen with nectar, so it forms kind of a cake. So in this case, we can't see the corbicula, we only see the pollen. But one of the things that we do look at with the species is that the, is that the hairs on the sides of that corbicula, what are called the corbicular fringe, are black. Um, so they're not red as they are sometimes in some other species like Bombus bifarius and Bombus mixtus that are somewhat similar looking. So those are the features that will look like. I'm probably going to go a little faster through some of the additional species that we're going to talk about. I just wanted to sort of orient you to some of the things that we'll be talking about as we move through all of these individual species. Assuming I can find a way to advance these slides, which I'm having trouble doing. Mm, there we go. Um, sorry, I see that I left a little arrow there. I'm not sure what happened. OK. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Oh, so the next species here is Bombus melanopygus. Blanus, Bombus melanopygus um, is has two color forms, or, or really four, I guess, as you see up here. But there's really those that have red on them and those that do not have red on them. So there's a black color form as well. The black color form um, is sometimes referred to as Bombus edwardsii. And the nice part about the this species, unless you live in far northern California or far southern Oregon, is that there's a really clear geographic boundary. The red um, animals or the species that have red on them are generally found north of the Oregon-California border. And those that do not have red on them are generally found south of the Oregon-California border, including those in the Rockies um, ha usually have red on them. So. If you live in California, you will see the Edwardsii form. If you live elsewhere in the West, you will see the red color form that we are describing here. What we're going to look at for this species is um, it looks a lot like Bombus huntii. It has yellow, red, red, yellow banding on its abdomen. But you'll notice if you look at its thorax, it's got instead of a strong interalar black band here, it's got sort of a mix of yellow and black hairs throughout the frontal part of its thorax. So between its wings and forward, you see a strong admixture of black and yellow hairs, a character that I often refer to as, as being cloudy. It's kind of a gray color or a cloudy color. And that strong admixture is something that really pops out. That same admixture is often found on T4. So that yellow on T4, as you can see in the cartoons over here, is not a bright yellow as we see in Bombus huntii. It is mixed with those black hairs. So we're seeing cloudiness on T4 in addition to cloudiness in front of the wings. So it looks like oh there we go. Are you advancing those slides, Lee? For am I? Yeah, it, it says to, it says that you you I'm waiting for you to control the screen. So I I've given it over to you. I'm not sure what you're supposed to do to control it, but <laughs> okay. I I think maybe I can't do it while I'm annotating the screen. So that that may be the problem that I'm running into. All right, um, I'll advance the slides if you just tell me when. Okay, you can advance the slide. I think you have to take control uh back back over okay that worked okay the next species that we're going to talk, talk about is bombus rufocinctus um i will say as you can see if you look at the cartoons above the map there this species has a ton of variety there are probably more different color patterns for this species than you will find of any other species in north america and my understanding, at least I've never observed a nest of this species, but my uh, understanding is that that variation can even occur within a single nest of this species. So this species, <laughs> there are basically no consistent color patterns for this species. There, they do often have red on them. And so that is something that you will notice. I say would say that particularly in the West, um, in the Western US, we get a lot of of these individuals with red. I think the further east you go, the less likely they are to have red, although they can still have them. So 
just just beware. So a lot of times here in the West, they will have red on them. The, the one feature that we will look at for this species, probably the most consistent character for this species is there on T2 where this arrow, this purple arrow is, um, here, I'm gonna go back so I can have, I can annotate and show my arrow here. So here is T1 is, is yellow on this individual. And T2, you can see here has red on the sides but in the middle of T2, there's what we call a crescent here of yellow. So, and you can see that if you look at the cartoons, a lot of these cartoons you'll see, even when it's all yellow, that um, the yellow on T2 appears as a crescent or a half moon. Um, and that feature is fairly consistent with this species. It also has very a very boxy, uh, almost square abdomen or thorax rather, when looked at from above. And it usually has very short, even hair, as you can see in this individual here. The other feature that's very important for this, so if you see that crescent of yellow on T2, it's a good indicator that it's Bombus rufocinctus. But the thing that we want to look at to verify that is the cheek length. We've talked about the ratio of the length to the width of, of the cheek. On this species, it is extremely short. So the width is significantly longer than the length of the cheek in this case. So the distance between the mandib mandibular hinges is larger than the distance between the eye and the bottom of, of the malar space there. So it's, it's really noticeable when you look at it. There's not a great photo of it here, um, but I, um, anyway, it's, it's extremely short. So that is something that you want to confirm before you just look at this crescent of yellow. Crescent of yellow is an important character, but um, adding that short cheek really will give you the piece of information that you know need. need. Short, uh, sorry, I'm getting confused here. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. thanks. Uh, next species is Bombus bifarius. Uh, this species, as Leaf mentioned, can be either red or black. Um, largely in California, I believe it's it's black. Throughout the higher elevations in the Cascades, we sometimes see red. And the further east you go into the Rockies, the more red you're going to get for this species. Just note that this species in some places has been divided into two species, into well, actually into three species. Um, Bombus vancouverensis is the is the species that's generally found through our our, our region. And then Bombus, by our region, I mean Oregon, California, and, and Washington, because um, Leaf and I are in, in the Pacific world. Well, Leaf's in California, I'm in Oregon. The further east you go towards Idaho and towards the Rockies is where you start getting into the true Bombus bifarius. There's some questions about that. The taxonomists are still arguing about whether they're truly different species or one species. So we're presenting them as one species as Bombus bifarius. Um, the identify, identifying characters are, are fairly consistent between the two. Um, for this species, one of the main things that we're going to look at is behind the wings. So it has that interalar black band, but behind that, the, the yellow behind the wings is bifurcated by black hairs. You can see that there is a strong admixture of black hairs um, in that area where those arrows are moving around there. And it, it, this is a, an important character to look at um, as closely as you can, because sometimes what you'll see there is kind of like a parting of hairs. And in between the yellow, you will see the integument of the bee. You'll see the skin of the bee. And it looks like there's black hairs in there. And it may not be bifarious in that case. But what we want with bifarious is to have strong black hairs all the way through that, that yellow. And it's a very distinctive character that is not shared by many other species in, in the West. It often usually has an admixture of yellow and black in front of the wings as well. And usually T2 here, and sometimes also on T3, will also have some black intermixed with the yellow. Sometimes you'll see it where it's almost entirely red, I'm sorry, with the red, not, not with the yellow. Sometimes you'll see T2 here with more uh, red than you see on this individual, but having some black on T2 is a fairly consistent with, with the ones that do have um, red on their, on their abdomens on T2 and T3. 
Unlike Bombus huntii, again, this one looks a lot like Bombus huntii, right? So it's got yellow, red, red, yellow on the abdomen. One of the characters we looked at with Bombus huntii is the corbicular fringe, and noting that that was black. If you look here on this Bombus bifurius, you can see there's kind of a golden color to the corbicular fringe. And that is something that we look at um, for for this species. So looking for those golden red hairs on the corbicula is another character that we will look for. Next slide. This is Bombus sylvicola. Bombus sylvicola looks a lot like Bombus huntii. It looks a lot like Bombus bifarius. The differences for this species are subtle and not terribly easy. <laughs> One of the things that we're going to look at is not a color pattern, but the length of the hairs. So for some of the species, um, like Bombus rufocinctus, I mentioned that the hairs were very short and even. For Bombus sylvicola, it's the opposite of that. Its hairs are very long and very uneven. So if you look at throughout this body, the body of this bee, you can see it's got hairs sticking up throughout the thorax as well as on the abdomen, you can just see that there's kind of hair sticking up. It looks like, you know, your, your son that just got out of bed that hasn't combed his hair yet a little bit, right? So that's something we want to look at for, for this species. The other thing that will differentiate this from Bombus huntii, from Bombus bifarius, from Bombus melanopygus, that all look similar, is this species, the females also have yellow on T5. So all of those other species, T5 was entirely black. With Bombus sylvicola, you will get yellow hairs on the side of T5. So long, shaggy hairs combined with some yellow on T5 is a pretty good indicator that you probably have Bombus sylvicola. You can see if you look at the distribution map on the, on the left here, on the lower left of this slide, this is not a terribly common species unless you're in the mountains, right? So we only see records here sort of at the higher part of the coast range in California, all the way up to the Siskiyous. And then there are some records in the Cascades in Oregon, in the Wallawas in Northeast Oregon, in the Cascades throughout Washington and the Olympics in Washington, and then down through the Rockies. So this is a higher elevation species. And one of those times when knowing where the photo was taken or where you are when you're, when you're looking at the bee, can help you decide whether Bombus sylvicola is an option. If you're in the Central Valley or you're in, um, you know, the 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 lower elevations of, of Oregon and Washington um, and Idaho, you're unlikely to see this species. It's really only a mountain species. Next slide. Okay. So we're moving away from that yellow, red, red, yellow banding pattern on the abdomen, and we're moving to a yellow, yellow, red, red banding pattern. The next couple of bees we'll look at will have this yellow, yellow, red, red banding pattern. So this will this group is a slightly different from that last group that we looked at. Bombus flavifrons um, is a is a fairly striking bee. A few things that we'll look at again. Um, in front of the wings and behind the wings for this species, you're going to see all that cloudiness. So an intermixing of black hairs in with those yellow hairs um, in front of the wings and behind the wings is a good indicator that you've got Bombus flavifrons. This species also has a very long cheek. You can sort of see it in this photo here. So the, the space between the bottom of the eye and the top of the mandib mandibular hinges here is longer than the than the distance between those two mandibular hinges. Um, and then again, yellow, yellow, red, red on the abdomen. For this, this is one of those species that will occasionally be found without red um, and, and actually fairly commonly found, especially in the Cascades, um, without red on it. And sometimes only T3, as you can see in the cartoons up here, sometimes only T3 which is uh, where this arrow, the purple arrow here is pointing, will have red on it and T4 can be black. Occasionally you'll find some, some pale hairs on T5, but generally um, those are black as well. So the, the abdomen goes yellow, yellow, red, red. Sometimes those red are replaced with black and then T5 and six are also usually 
black, although there can be some pale hairs there. Next slide. This species, in contrast um, to Vomus flavifrons, it looks an awful little lot like it. And I think the further south you get, the more the more these two species do look alike. So up in Oregon, Washington, you're going to see a lot of that admixture of black and yellow on the thorax, less so the further south that you get. But you can see here with Bombus centralis, in front of and behind the wings, there are no yellow, black hairs mixed in with those yellow hairs. They're entirely yellow. And it's just going to have that, in, that sort of clear interalar black band that's not muddled by black hairs mixing in with those yellow hairs. So that clear interalar black band. And then on the on the abdomen, it goes yellow, yellow, red, red, and again, black, black. Sometimes with this species, there are yellow hairs on the sides of T3 and T4, and you can just see it on the side of T3 right there. You can see some yellow hairs, and sometimes that's a character that I'll look for in, in the field as well. This species has a slightly shorter cheek than Bombus flavifrons. So if you were <laughs> to just look at one or the other, you'd probably have a hard time telling, you know, whether it was longer or shorter than the other. But if you had both of these species next to each other, Bombus flavifrons cheek is longer than Bombus centralis's cheek. Next slide. This is Bombus crotchdii. Um, of note, this species is, is pretty much endemic to California. There are some records, I think maybe one record from Nevada and some records from Baja, Mexico. But for the most part, this species is only found in California. And you should know that this species has been petitioned for California Endangered Species Act um, protection, and it's currently a candidate species. Um, so this species is protected in the state of California. And you cannot, therefore, you cannot handle this bee without a scientific collecting permit. If you have questions about that, I would go to the California Bumblebee Atlas webpage where we talk about how to get on our scientific collecting permit to allow you to be able to handle and photograph this bee. Um, this is another species that has very, very short hair, um, very even hair. Um, and generally, what we're looking for with this species, if you look at the, the cartoon here, it's going to have largely a black face. The vertex or the top of the head is going to be yellow, however, and you can see that sort of little mohawk there. And then in front of the wings is going to be yellow. And then usually behind that, it's going to be all black throughout the rest of the thorax. And then T1 is going to be black. T2 is going to be yellow. T3 is usually going to be black. And then the tail here, usually some version of T4 and T5, the last two big segments on the abdomen there, are going to have some red on it. Occasionally, they will have no red on it, and it will be they will be black, as you can see in the cartoons here. Um, but I, I think Leaf has told me that it's around 75% of the bees have some red on four or five, and 25% of the bees have no red. So that is, so generally, more often than not, you're going to see this species with red. As you can see from the map, this is kind of a lower elevation and coast range species. And the biggest population stronghold currently for this species seems to be in Southern California. Next slide. This is Bombus mixtus, is also a, a red-tailed bee. So the last species that we saw, Bombus crotchdii, had red on the tail. This species, as you can see, has uh, is a lot shaggier, so its hairs tend to be longer than Bombus crotchdii. It also doesn't share a whole lot of localities with Bombus crotchdii, so you wouldn't find them in many of the same locations. This is more of a mountain species, um, although we do find it throughout the Willamette Valley and the lower elevations of the Pacific Northwest for sure. Um, but for this species, we're going to look at an admixture, again, that cloudiness between the wings and in front of the wings usually less cloudiness behind the wings. And you can see that in this specimen here, where in front of the wings, we see a lot of admixture, and there's only one or two black hairs intermixed um, on the, um, well, behind the wings on the thorax. The color banding pattern on the, on the abdomen, T1 is, is always yellow. 
Sometimes we'll see a crescent of yellow on T2 or T2 can be entirely yellow. And then usually on T4 and T5, we will see brownish, reddish hairs. I will say that sometimes those hairs can fade to a almost tan color. So that can be confusing as well, that, that it's not always red. They fade, as you can see in the cartoons here, where it almost looks yellow. Um, but that's what we're going to look at for this species. Next slide. This is a, a very similar species to Bombus mixtus. Um, this is really only a high elevation species, though. We only ever find it at, at really high elevations um, in the Cascades, um, in the Wallawas and then the Olympics. These, there's a couple of records along the coast here of, um, of Oregon and California. I suspect those could be misidentified specimens sitting in a museum somewhere, but I'm not entirely sure. So this species is usually, usually found in colder areas. In contrast to Bombus mixtus, we have no admixture of black and yellow in front of the wings here. So it's entirely yellow. And then for this species, we often, as I said, have a crescent of yellow on T2. Bombus frigidus is going to yell, the T2 is going to be entirely yellow. Um, and then it's going to have those brownish, reddish hairs on T4 and T5, as you see on, on the bottom there. Next slide. And this is um, another species that is high elevation. It looks a lot like Bombus frigidus. Um, the differences between this species and Bombus frigidus are going to be found by looking at the face. So the colors on the hair, uh, sorry, the colors of hair on the face for Bombus curbialis are going to be black, whereas there would be some yellow usually with Bombus frigidus. But more significantly, the cheek of Bombus curbialis is significantly longer than it is wide, probably more so than any other species. This is in the only this is the only member of the subgenus Alpinobombus that's found in the lower 48 states. And that subgenus has very well, some of the species in that um, subgenus have very, very long cheeks. And this is this is one of them. So that's one of the things we're going to look for. You're only going to find this species at the highest of elevations throughout the western United States. You can tell by looking at the map, there are some records here in the High Sierra. Um, and then there are some records in far northern um, Washington um, near Mount Baker um, and in the Pesatan Wilderness are the only two places where this has been found in, um, in the state of Washington. And then there are some throughout the high elevations of, of the Rocky Mountains as well. Next slide. Oh, there, this is just to indicate that this species has not been detected in, in Oregon. Um, and, and the lower cascades in, uh, in, um, in Washington. But there are certainly higher elevation mountains there. Um, and, and so that we just have this question, like, is this just a search effort thing? Are there populations of this species, you know, in remote mountains of, of the cascades? And, and we're, we're still hoping to find it. All right, thank you, Rich. Um, with that, I am gonna take over and uh, talk to you about our, our uh, second group, of bees, which is uh, the bees that are primarily black and yellow striped, and T1 is yellow, as opposed to T1 being black, and we'll hear about those species in a minute. We have uh, 10, if I'm not mistaken here, and um, as we've been discussing, you will see a few species twice. Um, you'll see a spe uh, an animal on this list, for example, Silvicola in the bottom right-hand corner. We've just talked about that one as having a red tail, um, here it is in its black and yellow form, which occurs uh, uh, in the Sierra Nevada. So um, there are some familiar faces here, even if the color patterns are now going to be quite different. So uh, the first one we'll talk about is the black-tailed bumblebee or Bombus melanopagus or melanopygus. Uh, and, and you did see this one earlier when Rich was talking about it, having red hair on T2 and T3. Again, in California, this bee is uh, was formerly a different species called Bombus edwardsii, and we now know them to be the same species. Um, the taxonomists of the early 20th century were confused because they look so different, 
But if you just swap the hair color for from T2 and T3, there's really no difference between the bees um, uh, of any significance. And we now know that they're there's th they're the same species and closely related. Um, in fact, in uh, so as Rich said, right near the Oregon California border, you can find both uh, red and black morphs in the same populations, which is kind of fun. So uh, again, for this guy, we're going to be looking for. Uh, for a mixture of yellow and black hair on the front of the thorax. Uh, and then the back of the thorax is going to be yellow. It can have a little black hair mixed in, but it, it can also be largely yellow. Um, the face and the head, sorry, the, the face and the vertex are largely yellow. They're, they are often bushy yellow. Uh, they can have some black hair mixed in, but they're distinctively yellow, especially uh, the face. And then this bee has a, a, a abdomen pattern where it's yellow on T1, then it's gonna be black on T2 and T3. And then there will be yellow again on T4. And importantly, there's also yellow on T5, at least at the sides. And uh, we'll see in a minute some other bees that look similar, but do not have that uh, that yellow hair there. And recall, Rich talked about the color of the bristles on the um, on the pollen basket or scopa or corbicula. There are three ways to describe this thing. And you can see on this animal that they are largely dark in color, and that will help us to distinguish them from, um, from another species that it closely resembles. And that is the two-form bumblebee, Bombus bifarius. You've also already met this one in its red form. And this was the example in the slide about how bumblebees look different in different parts of their range. So uh, here is the black and yellow form um, found especially in California and um, in certain other parts of the range as well. So it is superficially similar to, uh, to the last one, to Bombus melanopigus. So it's, uh, it's a combination of yellow and black hair. Um, this animal has yellow hair on the face, just like the last one. Um, it has a mix of black and yellow hair on the front of the thorax. And you can see that here, it's not indicated by a purple arrow, but you can see black hair mixed into the yellow at the front of the thorax. And then importantly, and as Rich described before, the black band of the thorax, uh, the black hair bleeds back into the yellow at the hind side of the thorax in a V shape. So from this angle on this animal, you can't see it all the way, but there is black hair that, that bisects these two patches of yellow hair and points in a in a sort of a triangle right back towards the abdomen. It's a distinctive feature and um, you, with a little experience, you'll, you'll start to see it right away. Um, like the last one, this one has a yellow T1 and then it has uh, black hair on T2 and T3 um, and then uh, yellow on T4 again. But importantly, for in most cases, there is not yellow on T5. So T5 is black again, and that's different, different from the last species we looked at, uh, Bombus melanopigus. Okay, moving on. Uh, this one is, a, as one you've already seen, this is Bombus flavifrons, the yellowhead bumblebee. Um, and as Rich said, it is red in, in most of its range on the abdomen. Um, and uh, in certain places in uh, the Pacific Northwest, and then especially in California, uh, especially in coastal populations, it looks more like this. So it's going to be um, a, a combination of black and yellow. Uh, starting at the head, we are going to see um, this bee has a distinctively long cheek, as we, as we discussed uh, before. Um, it has on the thorax, on the front, it has disti uh, distinct uh, black hair mixed into the yellow hair. It's, it's, a, it's, vari it's a variable trait. Um, most bees in, of the species have some black hair mixed into the front of the thorax. Um, unfortunately, at the southern end of the range in California, they can be wholly yellow in this area, making things very difficult. Um, and then moving, uh, the oh, I should say also the... Um, the hind band, uh, yellow band of the thorax is mixed with some black hair also. So you have a black band in the middle and then yellow and black hair mixed together at the back of the thorax. The abdomen has the first two segments yellow, um, sometimes with black hair medially or in the middle, um, as you can see in the cartoons, but not on this animal from this angle. Um, and then the rest of the abdomen is gonna be black. 
So um, uh, there aren't very many other bees that look like this in the West. Um, it, it looks a lot like a one that I can think of um, um, from the East that just, just gets into areas of the Pacific Northwest. And we'll talk about in a minute, but for the most part, this is a distinctive looking animal when you see the um, the, the black and yellow color form. Um, and remember, uh, the 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 um, the cheek is distinctively longer than species it's it's closely related to. All right, our next one is called brown belted bumblebee or Bombus griseocollis. This one is found coast to coast, as you can see from the, the inset map there. It's very common uh, in most of its range. It's especially common in the east where it is it has uh, increased in commonness in the last several decades. Um, it's a striking, uh, uh, often large animal with very short, even hair, which you can see nicely in this image. Um, it's distinctive, I think, this bee. Um, it's going to have black facial hair for the most part, black hair of the face, and then black hair on the vertex. So uh, we've talked about lots of um, admixtures of black and yellow there and yellow hair there. This one is going to be black in most cases there. Um, the thorax is mostly yellow. It usually has some degree of black hair right in the center as a spot. It's a spot that does not connect to the uh, to the wing bases. It's it's a it's a, a tiny little circle or a larger circle, but it is not as extensive as the black that you've seen on some some other animals. Um, T1 of the abdomen it will always be yellow, and then T2 typically is yellow at its leading edge. Sorry, at, at its anterior side, so this the side closer to the head. And um, and then on the on the back end, the posterior side of the segment, it's going to have uh, brown hair medially, um, this distinctive sort of uh, orangey brown color, and then black or, that is distal to that 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 um, surrounds that. Uh, in some rare cases, you'll have an all yellow T two, which makes this be hard to identify. But in most cases, you're going to have that that uh, umber brown spot medially on T two. Um, the other thing is this is a bee with a short cheek, and um, that's that makes it distinctive relative to some others that you could confuse it with. Um, it's found commonly in lots of places in, in the West, uh, I would say at relatively lower and middle elevations. Uh, and uh, where I work in California, it only gets into extreme Northwestern California and just a little bit uh, south, farther south on the east side of the state. All right, the next one is yellow bumblebee, sometimes called uh, golden northern bumblebee, I think, um, Bombus fervidus. This is another coast to coast species you can see from that map. And I apologize for the, the, the change in format with this slide. We're combining two slide decks with a couple of slides um, from this one. Um, and uh, so the color pattern, the color in the maps are different. Um, but uh, this species across most of its range in the US is largely yellow, like the cartoon in the upper left hand corner of the, the queen um, grid there that's mostly yellow, um, similar to the bee that I'm depicting here. So what we're going to we're, we're going to see is the face is one of the only parts that is not yellow. It is uh, the face is black. The vertex has black hair. Um, the cheek is long. Um, it's 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 quite long. It's not the longest. Um, Rich described that one, but it's it's distinctively longer than it is wide. Um, and then the thorax is going to have um, all yellow hair at the front, all yellow hair at the back, and a black band across the top of the thorax right between. Um, this is a little bit variable, and it and the reason for this is that the farther west you go, the more black seeps into the body of the bee. Um, and this includes in the abdomen, where in this specimen you can see T1 through 4 are largely yellow, but you can see a little black hair, I think it's on T2. Um, and so the farther west you go, the more black will turn up on the abdomen. And uh, on the Pacific coast in California, this animal looks um, mostly black. And you'll see that, you'll see, you'll get a chance to see that in just a second. It's like the cartoons on the right side there. And so um, it looks very different from the all yellow one. And here is a place where we go to that cheek and um, it's distinctive. It's the same in both the yellow ones and the black ones. Um, this is a species that may be uh, on the decline in the east. We're not really sure in the west. I haven't heard a lot of concern about it here, but uh, it is dis it's definitely um, becoming less common in the U.S., and so some people are concerned about its status. 
Uh, okay, um, Bombus pensylvanicus, American bumblebee. This is another coast to coast species. Uh, although, uh, unlike many of that you've already seen, this one does not get very far into Canada, does not trend northwestward toward Alaska like so many bumblebee distributions do. Um, this one is a bee of, of generally of hot, lower elevation places. Uh, it's very common in the southeastern US. It's probably the first or second most common species there. Um, and uh, this is a, a really sort of handsome, large bodied bee. Uh, it's got a, um, a long cheek longer than longer than wide it's got black hair on the vertex and the face so this is another one like let's say uh, uh bombus griseocollis which we just saw black face black vertex um the uh the abdomen is going to have a yellow band of hair usually not mixed with black at the sorry the thorax <laughs> there's a yellow band of hair at the front um, usually not mixed with black uh, typically, it has a black band across the top of the thorax. And then in some populations, you'll see yellow behind uh, that on the thorax. And in others, you will not. In others, it, the, the back end of the thorax is all black. Um, and then the abdomen is usually going to have T1 yellow, although not always. And um, typically, the uh, first three abdominal segments are going to have yellow on them, followed by black. Um, this bee has darker colored wings than many, and we're pointing to that with this arrow. Um, I hope you can see that they're, they're just a little bit more cloudy or, or a gray in color. Um, and that is actually a good enough field character um, in concert with other things to, to help you understand that it is this bee that you're thinking about. This one was petitioned for listing um, uh, by the federal government, and they uh, declined to do so. Um, it is a bee of conservation concern. Um, and in the West, uh, there is a population that is called Bombus sonoris. Some taxonomists say it's a separate species, and some say it's part of Pennsylvanicus. Um, so the bee that's the 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 bee that's found in um, the Southwest and in Southern California, that is going to be the sonoris version, not the Pennsylvanicus um, uh, version. Uh, okay, uh, we're almost done with this section. Um, next, we'll look at Nevada bumblebee. This is Bombus nevadensis, found broadly throughout the West. Um, this one is a large, short-haired bee. It's it's really striking and beautiful. It's it's a lot bigger than many other bees you'll see. Um, it has a long cheek. It has, uh, let's see, a black hair on the face and vertex, although there can be yellow hair mixed into that sometimes. It typically has a black spot of hair on the top of the thorax surrounded by all yellow hair. So you can see in the cartoons and you can see the arrow pointing to it in this photo, there's a black spot on the top of the body. Um, usually that does not connect the wing bases. It's a spot, um, not, the whole, not the whole thing. And then the abdomen is going to have yellow hair on T1, 2, and 3, uh, and black hair beyond that. Um, this bee, uh, remember that I said this bee has a long cheek. That is the most important way to distinguish it from the next one that's coming. You do see a couple here that are, have red on the abdomen in the cartoons. We don't have to worry about these. These are very rare uh, color morphs that occur in Humboldt County, Northern California, and on one of the Channel Islands in California. And um, I've never seen them, uh, and most people haven't. And so it's unclear just how common they actually are. All right, our next bee looks a lot like this one. Uh, it's called Morrison bumblebee or Bombus morrisoni. So again, we have a large bodied, short haired, just really beautiful bee. When you see this one, it will stop you in your tracks. Um, the, the yellow color is this bright um, kind of buttery, uh, bright yellow that's distinctive to me um, in its particular hue. Um, this bee has a short cheek, okay? So I said that Nevada bumblebee had a long cheek. You're gonna need to look at the cheek to distinguish these two species. Um, then this one has yellow hair, it typically has yellow hair in the vertex, which the arrow is pointing to. And remember that that other one, uh, Nevadensis, had mostly black hair there. Uh, this bee has a yellow thorax, typically with no black hair whatsoever at the top of the thorax, where Nevadensis had that spot, okay? And then the abdomen is going to have um, three or so segments with uh, predominantly yellow hair, with all yellow hair. The final one is often um, um, curtailed on the sides and there's black hair on the sides of it. So on T3, you can see black hair just on the side of the segment. That's a somewhat typical look for um, Bombus Morris and I. Uh, this is a, a bee of conservation concern. It's a species of greatest conservation need in four Western states. 
And um, in California, it is a candidate for listing under the state's Endangered Species Act. Uh, okay, and I think this may be the last one in this section. This is half black bumblebee or Bombus vagans. Uh, this one uh, uh, occurs um, in the east and then um, in a sort of uh, band going northwest toward uh, um, northwestern Canada and Alaska. Um, it is a bee that is largely yellow on the front of its body and largely black on the back of its body to, to generalize a bit. So it's a bee that will have um, a cheek that is just a little bit longer than wide, but mm, it's a it can be equal also. It's a, it's a tricky one there. Uh, the face is going to have a mix of, of pale and dark hair, and the vertex typically does also, as you can see in this animal. Um, the, the abdomen typically has all yellow hair on the, sorry, the thorax <laughs> typically has all yellow hair on the front, all yellow ha hair on the back, and then some degree of black hair on the top of the thorax. So this one, it looks like the black hair is intermixed a bit with some of the yellow. Um, you can also see a really strong spot there, or you can see a really nice strong rectangular band that goes right across and connects the two wing bases. Um, the abdomen has T1 and T2 all yellow. Um, there may be a few scattered black hairs mixed in on the edges of T2, um, but then the rest of the abdomen is black. So it's a pretty simple abdomen. Um, uh, this is a bee that I don't see in California, but is really common in the east where I used to live. So I, I know it well, but not from, not from the west. Um, okay, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rich now for uh, bees that are striped with T1 being black. Fantastic. Thanks, Leif. Um, as you can see by looking at the cartoons here, there are a lot of these that look strikingly similar to each other, um, and differentiating them can be quite challenging. Um, we'll be looking at the location of that banding of yellow, um, as well as sort of the characteristics of it, the, the length of the hair and other things. And we'll also be looking at um, some other features. This is the first time in this group that we'll be actually looking at the underside of the bee. We'll be looking at the sternal segments to see the color patterns there, which can sometimes matter as well. Let's get started. Leaf, next slide. Um, the first of these is probably the most common bumblebee along the western states that, that border the coast. Um, basically from the Cascade, Sierra Crest, westward, I think pretty much everywhere, this is the most common bumblebee that you will encounter. The common name is the yellow-faced bumblebee. It's also sometimes called, and I think its official name is the Vazasensky um, bumblebee, although that, that doesn't differentiate it too much from its scientific name, Bombus vazasensky. Um, for this species, like Bombus huntii that we started with when we were looking at the red, this has a very consistent color pattern um, there are there's almost no variation for the females. Um, it's going to have a bright yellow face. The front of the thorax in front of the wings is going to be bright yellow. And then it's going to have a bright yellow stripe on T4. So the fourth turgal segment, one, two, three, four, is going to be yellow. You'll notice that this purple arrow here is pointing towards the underside of the B. It's not entirely clear um, from this photo, but what, what this is pointing towards is those hairs on the bottom, the sternal segments, so that the back of the bee uh, is the, are the turgal segments, the underside of the bee are the sternal segments, the corresponding segments. On Bombus Vazasinski, all of the hairs, or most of the hairs, at least on, on those sternal segments are going to be black like strikingly black in color so that its entire abdomen is going to be black. Some of the other species that are lookalikes here are going to have yellow hairs there, which is one of the characters that we will look at um, for um, to differentiate. But that's that species. Next slide. Um, so very close lookalike species here, Bombus collagenosus. Um, this is called the obscure bumblebee, sometimes also called the fog belt bumblebee, appropriately. This is really a coastal species. It's only found in the coast ranges of California and then up 
basically to the foothills of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington, usually at lower elevations and, and most commonly along the coast. In many ways, it looks exactly like uh, the yellow-faced bumblebee. It has a yellow face, yellow shoulders, black behind the wings, and then a yellow stripe on T4. Um, sometimes this yellow stripe on T4 can be a little thinner, so it can have black hairs um, anteriorly on that segment. So towards the head, sometimes the front of T4 is a little bit black. And you can see that in the cartoons over here to the left. Sometimes this stripe on T4 can be thinner with bombus collagenosis. You can't see it in this photo, but another thing that often you'll see on T4 for this species is in the middle, especially anteriorly, you will see some black hair. So the yellow stripe is kind of bifurcated um, so that there's a left and a right-hand side. And again, we can't see that in this photo, um, but you will often see that as a character. And also you'll see this purple arrow here is pointing to the sternal segments. So on the underside of the abdomen, you can see there's two thin, wispy um, lines of yellow hairs there. And that is a key characteristic for looking at this species. It also has a slightly different cheek length to Bombus fastasenskii, but unless you have a lot of comparative material around, I don't think this is a character that you can use to reliably um, separate these two species. So looking for these sternal segments. The other characteristic we look at is the shagginess of the hair. So Bombus vasosinskii, if you go back a slide, Leith, could you just go back? You'll notice if you look particularly on the thorax here, it like almost has a crew cut, like it just got out of the barber. All of those hairs is in a straight line across there. There's nothing sort of out of place or sticking up. That's usually how Vazosinski looks. And if you go um, forward, you'll notice if you look on the thorax here that those hairs are sticking up a little bit. There's a little shagginess to them. They're a little bit longer. Um, so this is a character that we also look at, although it's always good to combine them with these other characters that we're looking at, the bifurcated yellow stripe on T4 and the yellow hairs on the sternal segments of the abdomen. Next slide. This species um, is also very similar to Bombus vasosenskii and Bombus collagenosis. It has a bit more variation in its color patterns. If you look up here in the cartoons, sometimes you'll see that it has yellow behind the wings but more often we'll find this species without yellow behind the wings. And sometimes it has more yellow on the abdomen and sometimes less. But always this species has its yellow stripe and a complete yellow stripe on T3. So unlike Bombus collagenosis and Bombus vasosenskii, which have either yellow stripe on T4, this one is one stripe anteriorly. So it's on the, on the third antennal segment. In addition to that, this species also has long, wispy, yellow hairs on the sternal segments of its abdomen, pretty broadly throughout much of its abdomen. It's not just those two thin lines that we saw with collagenosis, it's throughout much of the abdomen. Um, so this can be a close lookalike, particularly from a photo. So really trying to get a sense of where T1, T2 are and where T3 are can be very challenging. You notice, I, I think you can see my arrow here, but you'll notice you can actually see there is a differentiation between T1 and T2. You can sort of just see this line, um, and I think Leaf's arrow is joining mine if you can't see mine there. Um, but yeah, so you can see that T1 is up here, T2 is this big broad segment, and then T3 is where we see the yellow. Um, and this can be very difficult in a photograph. So. Um, you know, something you have to be really, really, really careful with. Um, but that's Van Dyke's bumblebee. Similar distribution to Bombus vasosenskii, less commonly found on the coast. So you're more likely to confuse this with Bombus vasosenskii than you are with Bombus collagenosis, although they are found in the same locations. Next slide. Uh, this is Bombus fervidus. Um, so you've saw this earlier in the um, yellow or T1 yellow stripe. Um, and those were the, the yellow color forms on the cartoons up here. This species formerly known as, or some people still call it Bombus californicus, was thought to be a separate species. 
Um, this is the color pattern that was sort of known as Bombus californicus, where we have a, a long cheek, a black face, the top of the head, the vertex is also black, then it has yellow shoulders, and then from those yellow shoulders all the way to T4, it's black, and then yellow is T4, or, or T4 is yellow. So this species, basically, if you think about Bombus vasnesenskii or Bombus collagenosis, and you take out the, the yellow hairs on the face and you replace them with black hairs on the face. And that's what Bombus fervidus does. So to separate this from collagenosis and Vosnesenskii, we're gonna look at the colors of the hair on the face. And this species also has a very long cheek as we described earlier. This color pattern is generally gonna be found west of the Cascade Sierra Crest. You're not gonna find it too much east of the Cascade Sierra Crest. And there will be intermediaries as you between the yellow and the black form, as you see in the cartoons above the map there. Next slide. We talked about this species already. This is Bombus crotchdii. Um, again, the only difference between the one we described earlier, where it had red at the tip of the abdomen, is there are some, around 25% of them, I believe, that, that do not have a red tail. So these are gonna have black hairs on T4 and T5, but we're gonna look for the same characteristics that we did earlier. Short, even hair, yellow on T2, short cheek, yellow vertex, black face. Those are the characteristics that we're gonna look at. And just a reminder that this is a uh, protected species in California right now under the California Endangered Species Act, as it is a candidate species. Next slide. This is another species of conservation concern. It is also a candidate species under the California Endangered Species Act. It has also been petitioned for Federal Endangered Species Act protection. The map here on the left um, only shows its distribution in California. Hopefully, if you take a look at the larger inset map here, you can see that it at least once upon a time was broadly distributed throughout the Western United States. It has disappeared through a significant portion of its range, especially along the coast. It has been largely lost west of the Cascade Sierra Crest, except for on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. Um, for this species, uh, it, it, it can be quite variable. Generally, this species is gonna have white or snow white hairs on the tail here. So on T4 and T5, we're gonna be looking for white, like snow white hairs, Sometimes those can fade to a cream color, and this is particularly true for those of you in California, um, especially along the coast. When you look for this species, you could confuse it maybe with Bombus crotchdii even. It looks a little bit like that. It, it's almost that same coloration. The difference between crotchdii and occidentalis is this yellow band here is on the third turgle segment, not on the second. You'll remember crotchdii had it on the second turgle segment. The hairs here are also longer than Bombus crotchdii. Um, and usually there's gonna be a little bit more yellow mixed in in other parts of the body behind the wings um, on T2 sometimes, um, but just to the sides of T2. T2 is usually has at least some black on it. This species also has a very short cheek like Bombus crotchdii. Usually it has a black face and the black hair on the vertex although it can have some yellow hairs mixed in. And that is the Western bumblebee or Bombus occidentalis. An interesting thing of note here, can you just go back? It's cool, if you look at the pollen this bee is carrying, it's carrying two different species, at least two different species of, of, of pollen there. You can see there's sort of some black grayish pollen and then some yellow pollen underneath that. So sometimes it's fun to see the marbled patterns that bumblebees carry around. Next slide. This is um, Bombus franklini, Franklin's bumblebee. This is a federally listed species. It is also a candidate species under the California Endangered Species Act. So it has protection um, in Oregon and California. Um, and in California, it's also protected under the California Endangered Species Act. Um, this species is extremely imperiled. It has not been seen since 2006. The last observation of this species, uh, I believe, was on Mount Ashland in 2006, and it hasn't been seen since then. Um, 
This species has a very unique color pattern on its thorax. If you notice, we've been talking some about bees that have yellow shoulders, so in front of the wings um, has been yellow. This species has that, but the yellow actually continues all the way past the wing bases, such that it creates a really distinct horseshoe shape. It's almost like if you took the thorax of Bombus nevidensis with that strong black spot that Leaf talked about and then colored the hairs behind that black. So you can still see sort of half of a black spot, but then this big crescent of yellow on the thorax. It's a really distinctive shape. Um, I can't say I've ever seen this species in the wild, so um, but I have seen specimens of it, and it is very a very unique color pattern that I haven't ever seen on any other bumblebee. So that's a key characteristic to look at. And then on T5 of this bee, there are going to be some pale whitish hairs, um, often bifurcated by black hairs in the middle, but usually on the sides of T5, we're going to see some whitish hairs there. And again, that um, this species also has a very short cheek. And usually a majority of black and of, of black on the face, although often with yellow mixed in. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, this species is federally protected. If you are out and about and surveying for the Western, I'm sorry, for Franklin's bumblebee, and you happen to think that you have found it. Um, Ideally, you would have a, um, well, if you're in Oregon, <laughs> you don't need a permit to handle this species currently. Um, so you can handle it and take pictures of it. Um, and what we ask is that if you do take pictures of it, if you share the data on Bumblebee Watch, um, we would ask that you would mark the record as private. And we'll show you how to do that in, in a second here. And the reason is, is, you know, since this species has not been seen since 2006, we basically don't want to love it to death. We don't want a bunch of people that are excited about bumblebees to be traveling, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of miles to come see it and then destroy the habitat at the only location it's been seen. So we really want to keep that private until it's been fully documented. Please don't share it on social media. Um, you know, contact Leaf or I or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and let them know that you found it um, or let us know that you found it, but please don't publicize this publicize it wildly. That, that day will come, we will celebrate it, but we wanna make sure that, that we protect the, the habitat before, before we do that. Um, so, so the way that you would mark it is that when you go to record a sighting in Bumblebee Watch, on step two, where you upload the photos, you'll notice at the very bottom here is a where it's circled in red, there's an option to click that box and mark it as private. And what that will do is it will obscure it from the map so it won't show up there and it would only show up for experts like Leaf and I behind the scenes so that we can look at the photo and, and verify it, but, it, but it wouldn't be shown on the map. So again, please, um, please do that. If you're gonna survey for the species and look for it in California, you do need to have, at least if you're gonna capture it in a net, um, to take photos of it, you do need to have a scientific collecting permit. And again, I would direct you to the California Bumblebee Atlas website for instructions on how to get on the, the CABA um, scientific collecting permit to conduct surveys for the California Bumblebee Atlas. Next slide. Oh, so that is, uh, those are the T1 black species. Leaf is now going to talk about the species that have white hairs on their bodies somewhere. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, four species, and you have already met two of them, uh, Franklin Eye and Occidentalis. You've met them in the context of them having yellow hair somewhere on the body, um, and here uh, some of that yellow hair is replaced by white, as you'll see. So we'll start with this one called the white-shouldered bumblebee, uh, one you haven't met yet, Bombus appositus. Uh, this is a large, shaggy uh, bee, uh, somewhat long and uneven hair, and I think you can see that a bit on the thorax. Um, this is a bee with a very long cheek. It's a distinctively long cheek. Um, it's going to have white hair on the shoulders, very pale yellowish to white hair on the shoulders. Um, 
and then a black band between the wing bases. And then beyond that, you'll see uh, yellow or white hair on the back of the thorax. This hair is sometimes a little bit darker in color than the, than the pale hair at the front of the thorax. And then if you look at the abdomen, we've got five yellow segments, one after another. And this hair typically is darker in color than that front uh, thorax band that's pale. So uh, a typical look for this bee is you see this sort of golden yellow color and then a black stripe. And then at the front of the bee, you see a white band. Um, so this is a, a not an uncommon bee where it occurs. It's found at middle to upper elevations throughout the West. Um, and so, for example, we just would never see it in Southern California, uh, but we do see it commonly in the Sierra Nevada if we are at the right place. Um, so a, a cool bee that you have to travel up in elevation to see. Uh, moving on, um, this is the Western bumblebee again, Bombus occidentalis. And here it is with white hair on the tip of the tail. So I'll go through the uh, field marks again. As Rich said, this is a bee that has a short uh, cheek. So the cheek is shorter than it is wide. Not extremely short, but it is distinctly shorter than wide. Um, there's a mix of, of dark and light hair, but mainly dark hair on the face and the vertex. Um, let's say it's dark hair, but occasionally you'll see some yellow hairs mixed in. It's probably a more honest way to put it. Um, we'll have a yellow uh, sh uh, band of hair on the front of the thorax, the sort of shoulders, and then a black hair beyond that. Um, in some animals, we'll see yellow hair at the back of the thorax, but much more commonly, it's going to be black all the way back. So front band of yellow and then black hair all the way back on the thorax. The abdomen is variable. However, T1 is, uh, is usually black. And then we're going to have um, varied black and yellow hair on the rest of the abdomen. As Rich said, uh, T3 is um, usually yellow in this species. And um, uh, let's see. And then we and then we typically have pale hair at the at the tip of the tail. So um, Rich described the yellow ones that are particularly common in or were common in coastal places, for example, in California. Uh, and then throughout most of the range, it's going to be white. You'll really see white hair um, uh, just juxtaposed against that, that black hair. As you heard, this species has been um, assessed for listing by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It is not listed yet. There, we're, we await the decision on that. Uh, it's provisionally protected in California as a, uh, as a CESA candidate. Uh, and then it is an SGCN species in four Western states. Okay, moving on. Here's one you haven't met yet. This is Sitka bumblebee, Bombus sitkensis. This is one of several bees that has a really interesting distribution where uh, most of its distribution is Pacific coastal and maybe a few hundred kilometers inland. So you can see in California, it is largely just found on the coast. Uh, in fact, I think the, the green dots in the Central Valley and the Sierras are probably mistakes. They're not real uh, specimens uh, properly identified. Um, it does occur farther inland in, in Idaho and Montana, but um, if you were to look, if you look at that inset map, you can see it goes all the way out to the Aleutians and it's it's not very far from the coast um, all the way out there. Uh, this is a bee with long shaggy hair, so long uneven hair. Um, it has, uh, let's see, the cheek is uh, medium. It's about as long as wide, so not distinctively longer or shorter than it is wide. Um, this bee has a lot of black hair mixed in where it has yellow hair. So the front of the thorax, that yellow shoulder area, has lots and lots of black hair mixed in. It's very dusky. Then on the top of the thorax, we see uh, black, mostly black hair, sometimes a few yellow hairs mixed in, but it can be all black. And that black hair just continues right out to the back end of the thorax. So there could be yellow hair mixed in as there is on this animal towards the back of the thorax but not very much. The whole thing is going to be black or gray, except for that front band of the thorax. And then looking at the abdomen, we have two stripes of yellow. Um, and uh, this is some of the, in some animals, you can see a mixture of darker hair in, um, in both of those segments, especially medially. And then beyond that, we have dark hair, except for the tail, which is what the arrow is pointing to. And here we have some light hair on uh, segments uh, T4 and especially T5, sometimes T6. Um, this is light colored hair. It is not white. It is not orange. It is not red. It is a uh, sort of salmon pink, uh, a, a light uh, a light salmon pink, maybe um, 
a dingy yellow. Uh, it, it's it's distinctive, I think. It's a little bit variable. It's it's almost like a pale apricot in some animals. Um, I'm trying to distinguish it from uh, some of the others that you've seen. For example, Bombus mixtus, which typically has orange or red hair in place of that, um, not this sort of dingy, yellowish, tan, pinkish hair. So that is a distinctive thing about Bombus sitkensis. This bee is not uncommon where it occurs, but again, its distribution is, is somewhat limited um, geographically around the West. And then uh, back to Bombus Franklin eye. So, uh, or Franklin's bumblebee. Rich just talked about this one, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. The principal thing we want you to know is that um, Rich said it could have yellow hair towards the end of the tail, uh, T5. Um, it can also have white hair there instead, right? And again, it's bifurcated by black hair right down the middle of that segment in most animals, so far as we understand. Um, and in my experience looking at museum specimens, the yellow or white hair on the sides of T5 typically obvious, but in some cases it's not very many hairs. And so you really have to look and make sure that that hair is actually there um, when you're when you're looking at specimens or hopefully live animals of this species. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich for three cuckoo bumblebees. Thanks Leif. Um, as, you, as you peek here at the cartoons of the cuckoo bumblebees, you'll notice that they have color patterns that mimic many of the other species we've already talked about. And this is why it's really important if you go back to that early decision tree that we've talked about, it's really important to, to differentiate our true bumblebees from our cuckoo bumblebees before you try try to put a species name on it. So, so you really want to determine, is this a cuckoo bumblebee or is it a true bumblebee? And is it a male or a female before you start looking at color patterns? Otherwise, you're going to find yourself really confused. So for these ones, we will have decided that it was a female bee. We will have looked at its hind leg and we saw that it didn't have a corbicula, so it, it can't carry pollen around. So we're gonna know that it's a citherus or a cuckoo bumblebee. And then it'll take us to one of these three animals and we'll look at these a little more closely. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, the first of these is um, among the most common or at least here in the Pacific Northwest, it is the most common of the three that we, we see. Um, Bombus insularis, or the indiscriminate cuckoo bumblebee, is the common name for the species. Um, the main feature, I would say, to look at to differentiate these this species from the others is the yellow hairs here on the face. You'll notice that, that right by the base of the antennae there, there's just a tuft of yellow hairs. There are There's black hairs underneath that, um, but there is this really bright patch of yellow hairs right above the antennae in the species that when you get a view of the face, as you can see from the side angle, is very, very clear. Both of the other cuckoo bumblebees do not have yellow hairs in that area. They have an entirely black face, or at least the females do. Um, the, 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 the thorax of this bee is quite variable. Sometimes there's black or sometimes there's yellow behind the wings. Sometimes there's yellow between the wings. Sometimes there's black behind the wings and, 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 and in between the wings. So it's, it's hugely variable there. There is always yellow on T4 for this species. Um, although that yellow is usually not a solid band. It is usually broken up by at least some black hairs. Um, and often, as you see here uh, in this photo and where Leaf is moving his cursor there, it, there's, it's completely bifurcated by black hairs. And so that's another thing to look at for this species. But mostly you can key in on looking at the face. If you get a view of the face and you see that yellow tuft you, and you know it's a cuckoo bumblebee, you are dealing with Bombus insularis. Next slide. The next species is Bombus flavidus, the fernald cuckoo bumblebee. Um, you can see that the arrow at the top there is pointing towards um, the face. And you'll notice that while this species has yellow on the vertex, so its hat or mohawk or top of its head is yellow, the front of the face, including near the antennae there, is entirely black. So there's no yellow hairs there. And that is really the feature that we can look at to differentiate this species from Bombus insularis. So this species has a yellow vertex, but its face is entirely black. 
The other character that we we sort of try to describe by this lower inset photo on the lower right there is that this species has a very unique sculpture of its sternal and turgal segments. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but the, the phenotype of it or what it looks like is it's strongly recurved. If you can sort of look at me here, the tip of its abdomen, if you think about that as my fingers, is often pointing almost all the way towards the head of this bee. And you can sort of see it in this photo here, Leaf sort of showing you that curvature. But the very tip of its stinger or right where his cursor is right now is often almost pointing towards its face, like parallel to its body. And it's much more so than in either of the other cuckoo bumblebees in our region. And is another character you can use to differentiate this from Bombus insularis and Bombus sucleae. You'll notice in the cartoons here, this species also has yellow or pale hairs on T4, but there is not black hairs that bifurcate that. So usually the, the yellow hair for this species is also entirely solid. Next slide. And this is Bombus sucleae. Bombus sucleae, suckley cuckoo bumblebee, is also a California endangered species candidate. Um, in Species Act candidate, excuse me, and it has been petitioned for federal endangered species listing and is going through the species status assessment process right now. Um, this species, again, unlike Bombus insularis, has an entirely black face, and unlike Bombus flavidus, females of this species have a black vertex, or the top of its head is entirely black. So all of the hairs on the head of this bee are black, and that's a great way to differentiate it from either Flavidus or Insularis. Um, this species also, like Bombus insularis, has yellow on T4, but there's usually, or almost always, it looks like by the cartoons here, at least some black hairs in the middle of T4. Um, so that would be one way to differentiate this from Bombus flavidus. Another character that you will see often not in photos, but in a very detailed photo like the inset in the bottom right here, this is looking straight down at T6 of this B. And um, you'll see that you can see the sternal segments actually poking out underneath that, that turgal segment. Um, so these are called keels. And these strong protrusion of the keels that you see sticking out from the sides of the, of the turgle segment are very distinctive in this species. And there's no other animal in the Western United States that has that feature. So if you have a cuckoo bumblebee and you suspect it could be Bombus sucleae, that is a photo we would very much like you to take is, is straight down looking from, from T, from, the, from the, the very tip of the abdomen looking straight down is a great photo to take. It's also a fine photo to take a picture of the sternal segment there of, of S6 so that we can see that structure as well. Next slide. Or that's the end. Yeah. Back okay. to you, Leif. Back to me. Okay, so that is the end of our... Um, of our passage of talking about individual species by themselves, a sort of field guide, uh, I like to think of it as. We're now gonna tackle some pairs and trios of species that are hard to distinguish. And you'll hear us regurgitating some information here, but we want you to look at both in the same photo and start to think critically about what's different. For example, in this trio of bees that are called yellow-faced bees, um, and in this image, you can see uh, Bombus vasensenskii, um, Bombus van Dykei, and I think Caligenosis also. So speaking of those bees, here are all three of them side by side. So as you learned, um, uh, Bombus vasensenskii and Bombus caligenosis are very hard to distinguish. Um, they look grossly very similar. Uh, they, they are black bodied bees with uh, yellow hair on the face, yellow shoulders, and a yellow stripe on T4. That's how they're similar. Um, recall that uh, Rich taught you that um, that Bombus vasensenskii looks like it's had a crew cut. And um, there's just a very, very short, even hair from the front of the thorax toward the back of the thorax. Um, not that not that wispy stuff at the very back of the thorax, but you can see how, how even that hair is. 
Uh, by contrast, over on the left here, Bombus caliginosus, it is pokey. And um, this indicates the, the bee's hair is longer, but also it has both long and short hairs. So there are two axes of hair uh, traits that we like to talk about. It's long versus short, and it's also even versus uneven. So that, that hair length and shagginess or unevenness character is important in distinguishing those two. Recall also that we talked about how caliginosus has uh, yellow hairs on the sternal segments, I think that's three and four, where you can see those wispy yellow hairs on the underside of the abdomen. Um, and uh, Vosnesenskii usually does not have those hairs, although it can, unfortunately. <laughs> Confusingly, it, it can have a few of those yellow hairs. Um, so that's not always a, dis, uh, a good character. Uh, Rich talked about how there's often black hair medially for caliginosis in, in the yellow band on the abdomen. So just a little black hair poking in from T3. It's on T4, but it looks like a little V coming from the segment above it. Um, so the and then the cheek length was the other one that we talked about. So Vosnesenski I should have a cheek about equal uh, as long as wide. Caliginosis just longer than wide. Um, and again, as he said, uh, uh, don't try this at home until you're experienced. It is a difficult distinction using the cheek length for these two species. The third, the one in the middle, uh, that's Van Dykei. And you'll recall the big difference. Uh, in hair color pattern for this bee is that the yellow is on T3, not T4. Um, you also heard that there's yellow hair on the underside of the abdomen for this bee, and it's quite um, uh, extensive compared to caliginosis. So it's a, it's distinctive there. So um, there's all three of those next to each other. Um, they can sometimes be easy to distinguish when you can see them both in, or all, all three of them in the field. Um, and it's really, uh, it's much easier when you can actually look at pairs of them together or trios. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, so I, I talked about the yellow hairs on the underside of the abdomen. Here they are again, um, um, blown up a bit. So caliginosis, they're distinctive, although not, not a ton of them. Van Dykei, they're distinctive and, and much more abundant. And then on Vosnesenskii, we usually don't have yellow hairs there. Moving on, there we go. Uh, again, this is another view of the same bees. So now you can see the yellow hair just a little bit better on the underside of the abdomen. And you can see that in this case, Vosnesenskii lacks the yellow hair uh, being cooperative with us. <laughs> um, okay, moving away from the three um, yellow-faced bees, we're gonna talk about um, what we like to call the cloudy pyrobombus. So pyrobombus is a subgenus of the genus Bombus. Just like I said earlier, the word Scytheris, which is the cuckoo bumblebees, that's a subgenus also. Um, Pyrobombus is a large subgenus, lots of species. Um, and many of the species we've been talking about tonight are in that group. Here are three that are difficult for people to distinguish. So it's Sikensis on the left, Flavifrons in the middle, and Mixtus on the right. And when we say cloudy, these are the bees where the yellow is often has an admixture of black in many parts of the body. So looking at Sikensis on the left here, you can see there's black and yellow hair on the uh, on the vertex, for example, mixed in. Uh, the, the front of the thorax, there's extensive black hair mixed into the yellow band. And then uh, remember that the, the uh, back of the thorax, the center in the back of the thorax in this bee is all black or sometimes with a few yellow hairs mixed in. Um, that's to be contrasted with the next one over, flavifrons, where um, there's usually yellow hair at the back of the thorax, as you can see on this bee. So there's yellow at the front of the thorax, there's a broad black band in the middle, and then there is, in most cases, yellow hair at the back of the thorax. So that's different from Sikensis. Um, notice both of those bees have yellow on T1 and T2. Um, and then uh, we talked about how Sitkensis has that dingy yellow or pinkish, sort of pale pinkish hair at the tip of the tail. It does, and Flavifrons does not. So that's how we can distinguish those two species from each other. Um, and then the third one that often co-occurs co with both of those is Mixtus. And so again, lots of mixing of black hair into the yellow uh, on the front of the thorax. Not so much on in the yellow on the back of the thorax, um, and you can you can contrast that with the hair of flavifrons and the hair of sequensis in that area that will have some black hair mixed in. We then have uh, yellow on T1. T2 is yellow at least medially in the middle, and it can have black hair on the sides as well. And then remember that mixed this is the one with the reddish orange hair at the tip of the tail. 
So um, that distinguishes it from Sikensis, if um, if uh, in most cases, and then it distinguishes it from flavifrons, which does not have uh, light colored hair at the tip of the tail. Ah, sorry, here are some arrows. Um, I'm gonna go right through those arrows since I described them verbally. Uh, next slide, okay. Next group is large bodied, short haired, mostly yellow bees. There are just two species in this group. It's Nevidensis and Morris and I, those two that we talked about earlier. Um, and uh, so you'll recall, let me go back. Ah, there we go. Um, so you'll recall the vertex of Nevidensis it has black hair and sometimes some yellow, but it's strongly black. You see lots of black hair on the top of the head of this bee. Um, by contrast, Morris and I is mostly yellow there. So a, a bright yellow sort of mohawk. Um, Nevidensis has a long cheek and Morris and I has a short cheek. And that's what these boxes are supposed to be depicting. So you can clearly see that, I think, from the angle of these two heads that we have a, a, a cheek that's longer and a cheek that's shorter. Um, I said earlier something that was not true. Um, I said that Morris and I was a candidate for listing in California under the State's Endangered Species Act. I was wrong. It's a species of greatest conservation need in the state, but it is not currently a candidate for listing, thankfully. Um, so my mistake um, with that. Uh, okay, and here are the same two species now looking at a different angle. So here's Nevidensis on the left again, and you can see that black hair on the vertex that the arrow is pointing to. Um, you can see a black spot on the top of the thorax, which is typical for the species, as I said earlier. And then if you look at Morris and I, we see yellow hair on the top of the vertex, on the vertex, and no yellow hair in the middle of the thorax there. So those are a couple of different things we can look at to distinguish these two species. I always feel like in our um, slide presentations, these are distinct species. And then when I see them in the wild, I think they're a lot more similar um, than, I, than I expected. And um, so these are deceptively difficult is what I'm trying to say, at least for me. They look like they should be easy to identify, but they're not necessarily so. Okay, we'll move into this group where the abdomen is uh, has the first four segments are yellow, yellow, red, red. You'll recall that there are just two of those. Um, that's flavifrons outside of most of California and centralis everywhere. So centralis is one of those bees that Rich described as having very little variation. It typically, it's almost always has an has all yellow on the front of the thorax, all yellow on the back with a black band in the middle, all yellow T1 and T2 and then T, T3 and four are red, and beyond that it's black. Um, not variable whatsoever. Flavifrons, to which it is closely related, usually has black hair mixed in um, on the thorax. So we can see a lot of that here. On the front of the thorax, on the back of the thorax, there's yellow hair with lots of black mixed into it. And then there should be black in the middle. Um, but notice that the band of black is not distinct from the yellow. It kind of grades into the yellow to the front and the back of it. Whereas with centralis, we have a hard line there. Um, and that hard line is a good thing to look for with bees that don't have a lot of black admixture like huntii and like centralis. Um, now, uh, it gets complicated with this pair. In more northerly places, flavifrons usually has some black on the abdomen in T3 and T4. Even though it's, it's red on this animal, you'll usually have black hairs mixed in somewhere. Centralis, not so much. You will not have black hairs mixed into T3 and T4. The unfortunate thing is that as you go southward in the range into California, flavifrons can appear with with little or even no black hair in T3 and T4. Thus, it can look very, very similar to centralis. Um, many authors have said that centralis is a lower elevation bee, like a mid-elevation sort of foothills and mid-elevations of the Sierras, let's say, whereas flavifrons is a mid to upper elevation bee. Um, I, um, I'm I'm not positive that always holds based on, on my recent field work. Um, so these bees are, uh, it's potentially difficult to distinguish from each other. Uh, remember, they have different cheek lengths. And with experience, you can really exploit this character to your benefit. So flavifrons is the one that has a longer than a wide cheek. In this group, it is distinctly longer than it is wide, whereas centralis is just a little bit longer than wide um, or almost equal in its length and width. So that's one thing you can look at to distinguish those that pair. Uh, moving on to the next pair of difficult to distinguish species. Here we have Bombus bifarii on the left and Melanopagus on the right. Sorry about my dog. Uh, 
uh, Bifarious is the one you'll recall. Uh, it has a black band across the top of the thorax, and that black hair makes a V shape, and it points right back through the two spots of yellow on the back of the thorax toward the abdomen. That's distinctive there, and we don't see that in Melanopagus or Melanopygus. Uh, there, there is black hair in the middle of the thorax, but and it starts to point backwards, but it does not make its way through the yellow hair. Um, another thing for these bees is the tip of the tail. So T4 in both species is yellow, um, but in uh, Bifarious, it is often bisected by a little black hair right between, right in the middle, medially. Um, in uh, uh, Melanopagus, usually not, although it does look a little like that in this image. It usually is, uh, doesn't have that. Um, but the important thing to notice is that on Bifarious, T5 is all black. And on, on Melanopagus females, T5 has yellow on the sides. So it's pretty easy to distinguish this pair if you know what to look for. But um, those are two things to look for. But otherwise, they look very similar. The other thing that you heard earlier from Rich that I think is important is to look at the color of the bristles on the uh, pollen basket. For Bifarious, they are often reddish orange. And for Melanopagus, they are usually black. OK. Uh, moving on to the yellow, red, red, yellow abdomens. So we've looked at all of these bees already, but here they are all together. And so um, here's a roundup. And so uh, recall that Rufocinctus is the one that has a yellow T1, and then it, the T2 is gonna be yellow medially, and then the sides of it could be black, could be red. In this case, we're talking about the red ones. Um, and then it will have variable red and yellow as you go, go down the abdomen. Uh, Silvicola, remember this is the high elevation species with longer hair, and um, this bee is going to have, uh, let's see, it's got a mixture of yellow and black hair on the front of the, on the face, as well as in the vertex, um, sort of patchy yellow and black, and that's distinctive um, from Rufus Cinctus, which has black hair on the face. Um, uh, and uh, in Silvicola, the um, Yellow hair in much of the body is, is clear. It doesn't have a lot of black hair mixed into it with the exception of the, the vertex and the face. Moving over to the right, we see Bombus bifarius, the two-form bumblebee. Once again, this is the last slide we saw the black and yellow form. Well, here it is with red. And notice we're again telling you that on the thorax, the black hair points backward through the, thorax, the, the yellow spots of the, the hind side of the thorax. Same, whether the, the abdomen has red or not, that is a um, invariable character for this bee. Uh, again, T1 uh, T, uh, uh, and two will sometimes have black hair medially as depicted, well, uh, as, as seen on this bee in that, that tidy little triangle. Um, sometimes it's less obvious than that. Going to the bottom left, uh, hunty eye. Remember, this is the first one we saw. It is not variable at all. This is the color pattern for females. It's yellow, red, red, yellow. And there uh, is no black hair mixed into the yellow there. It's really clear yellow, bright, um, lemony, light colored yellow. And um, we're not gonna have any black hairs medially in the red either. And then finally, um, we have melan melanopygus at the bottom. The, again, we just looked at this one in its black and yellow form. Uh, remember that this species has cloudy hair on the thorax in the front. Um, and then has black a black band across the top, sometimes mixed with a little yellow, as you can see here. And then um, uh, T1 is yellow, T2 and 3 are red. And um, let's see, uh, T4 can have a little bit of dark hair mixed in with the yellow if, if memory serves for that one. Okay, um, almost done with this section. Um, so uh, we want to talk about Bombus franklini and two species that it can be confused with. You would think this fantastically rare bee would be super distinctive and we'd never mistake it for the most common bee in California or much of the West Coast, but here we go. Um, this is Bombus mosnesenskii on the left and uh, franklini on the right. Remember, franklini has that horseshoe of black hair that Rich talked about and the yellow hair of the front of the shoulders. It actually comes back past the wing bases all the way, almost to the uh, quite, quite far to the center of the thorax. So there's this horseshoe shape of black hair on the top of the thorax. Vosnesetsky, I know it does not have that. And the yellow hair does not descend distally past the wing bases. You can see that's all black hair there. Um, the other thing, uh, Bombus vosnesenskii is one of the so-called yellow-faced bees, lots of yellow hair on the vertex and the face. 
Franklin eye, you're going to have black hair on the vertex and yellow and yellow and black hair on the vertex. Uh, okay. Um, Franklin eye can also be confused with its close relative, which is Bombus occidentalis, the Western bumblebee. And so these guys are closely related. They are going to look a little more similar, I think. Um, again, Franklin and I with that horseshoe, we don't see that in Occidentalis. We do sometimes have a little bit of an arc there, but the yellow hair definitely does not trend backwards past the wing bases. You can see the wing base on the right side of this bee uh, with the Western bumblebee, and um, there's black hair right next to it. There is not yellow hair there. Whereas if we look at Franklin and I, you see that yellow hair coming all the way past the wing bases. Uh, the other big difference, Franklin eye, as you'll recall, has a little bit of white or yellow hair on T5 just at the edges with black hair in the middle. Bombus occidentalis or the Western bumblebee has a lot of white or yellow hair on T456. Um, it, it varies by individual, but it's distinct. There's a lot of that hair. Whereas with Franklin eye, it's just a little bit and it's a little bit harder to appreciate. So I'm now going to turn it back over to Rich for male bumblebees. Thanks, Leif. Um, I feel like we're we're running out of time here. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna launch a poll question here for everybody here. I, I, Leif and I have done this twice now, and I think each time we've done it, <laughs> we haven't gotten to the mails. So I'm just gonna post a question here that I just I just put together, um, just asking you if you would be interested in a one hour webinar that would cover male bumblebee identification. If you feel like this would be something that would be of interest to you and would be worth Leaf and I putting time together, just go. Okay, <laughs> okay, you're interested. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay, we <laughs> Leaf and I sometime, uh, hopefully before the end of the calendar year, will um, will put together some content for you uh, for an hour, and we'll sit down and talk about male bumblebee identification. Um, I'm just going to end this poll now. Um, and I'm going to skip over these slides right now because um, we had prepared a quiz for you at the end of all this, and I just think it would be fun um, to to go through that quiz and just make at least a little bit of this um, a, a little bit interactive. So we've got a series of, um, uh, oh, I guess I have to share results here. Okay, so there, yes, 98% of you are interested in a male Bumblebee webinar. So we're going to do that. Uh, oops. Okay. So uh, go to the first quiz question, Leaf. Uh, so which of these two species or two photos represents Bombus rufocinctus? You should have a pop up that will appear on your screen and go ahead and answer that. You don't have to. It's There's no grades. We don't know who's answering what. It doesn't matter at all. It's just a, a good indicator that, um, you know, this is not the easiest thing to do in the whole world. While you're finishing answering there, I'm just going to start chatting about the answer. Remember that Bombus rufocinctus is one of our most variable species. There's very little consistent that we have with the species. There were two things that were consistent that we often look for. Short even hairs is one of them, and a crescent of yellow on the second turgal segment. So there should be a slight crescent of yellow on this on the turgal segment. And then, you know, beyond that, it was having a short cheek and a bunch of other things. So for this particular, the two photos that you see here, I'll just quickly end the poll so I can get this off of your screen in case it's blocking the whole thing. Um, there you can see that most of you thought it was B, some of you thought it was A, which is just fine. I'm gonna stop sharing now um, so that you can see this. So the reality here is that it is B. So the, the one on the right here uh, is Bombus rufocinctus. You can see there's a, a slight, crescent of yellow, you can just see a hint of it next to that arrow. And then you can see that nice, even short hair and the boxy thorax there for Bombus rufocinctus. The other thing for this species is it usually, and I say usually very generally, or very generously, because 
uh, the species is so variable, but it usually has a black face like you see in the photo on the right there as well. Okay, next slide. Uh-oh. <laughs> we seem to have, oh! <laughs> Well, I think I think that this, slide's broken. Yeah, this one's <laughs> going to be difficult. Sorry, everyone. I can't explain what happened here, but uh, there are the field marks. It was A. <laughs> that's that's funny. Okay, moving on. Oh, uh oh. No. Well, it looks like our photos got yeah. disintegrated somehow. Oh no. Oh well. Look, it's that we're after eight anyway. Um, <laughs> We appreciate, oh geez, they all got messed yeah, up. Us. Well, I'm glad that only happened at the very end here and not during uh, the majority of our presentation. Um, I guess with that, we will say, <laughs> we will say thank you all very much for spending a couple hours with us on a Wednesday evening um, in October. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that it brings some interest to you in the off season since we can't see a lot of these animals in the wild anymore. Sometimes it's fun to see photos of them. Um, as we said, we'll record this. We will get it posted on, on YouTube and we will share it with all of you. Um, and as promised, Leaf and I will put together a bumblebee identification course where we only talk about males um, so that we can actually cover that content that, that we mean to. I, I didn't want to go over it so fast that it wasn't very meaningful. So I thought it made more sense to skip it. So um, yeah, Leaf, what else do you want to add there? Uh, my apologies for the blank slides. Um, they had colorful pictures on them a few hours ago. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us your attention. And um, as Rich said, we will present a, a, a webinar on male identification. It's always the sort of the hardest part that I really want to get to with these talks. And um, this is the second time we have failed to get there. So um, looking forward to seeing you again soon to talk just about the uh, other sex of the bumblebees. So thanks again for being here. The other thing that we will do is um, there was really some great, we have a knowledgeable crew here. There are a lot of really good questions in the Q&A. Leaf and I will will gather uh, uh, gather those up and download those and, and send those out to you because I think there's some really interesting information in there that you'll yeah. all, um, you know, if you're interested in going a little deeper, there's some some great questions in there. So We'll send those out as well so that you don't have to read them now before we kick you out. <laughs> but um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Really appreciate your time and um so so much fun to uh to talk bumblebees. Always a good time.